Welcome to the Transformative Principal Podcast, where we learn how to be an amazing educational leader. I am your host, Jethro Jones. Are you ready to be a transformative principal? I'm looking for about 10 people who are ready to do what it takes to lead with integrity, find balance, and take your school to the next level. If you're looking to improve your leadership in a measurable way, go to transformativeprincipal.org slash mastermind to see if you qualify to join a group of like-minded people who are ready to be the best principals in the country. Welcome to Transformative Principal. I'm pretty excited about this. Today, I got one of my teachers to join in on the interview with me. We're going to interview Michael Fenton of Desmos.com. He's the lead instructional designer, and I think I call him the chief instructional designer in the introduction, so sorry about that. But I'm excited to talk with him and learn about Desmos, and today we're going to talk about building great activities in a math class and how to get kids more engaged in conversation. So pretty exciting stuff. Thank you so much for listening and please uh, share this with any of your uh, friends and other principals who are interested in improving math at their school. Welcome to Transformative Principal. I am really excited to have Michael Fenton on the show today and another special guest, one of the teachers at my school, Diane Grupp. We are going to talk about Desmos, and Diane is much more of an expert on Desmos than me, so she actually uses it, and so she's going to be asking some of the questions. Michael Fenton is the chief instructional designer at Desmos, and we're going to talk about what Desmos is, and then also going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we face in using it and some questions that we have about how to use it well. So if you haven't heard of Desmos, I, you can check it out at desmos.com, and I'm excited to have Michael here. So Michael, thank you for being a part of the Transformative Principle. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for thanks for the invitation. And Diane, I'm excited that you're here as well. We talk nearly every day about instruction and teaching. And so thank you for being here as well. Thank you for inviting me. So we want to talk first about what Desmos is and why it was created. So Michael, can you give us just a brief background about what Desmos is? So those who are listening, if they haven't heard of it, they can have an idea of what it is. Yeah, absolutely. A couple years ago, that question was a little bit simpler to answer. Uh, if somebody said, what is Desmos? You know, I was a teacher in the classroom and I was using it pretty much every day with most of my classes. I'd say it's a free online graphing calculator uh, and it's not only better than the stuff that you're probably currently using, but it's also free and available on every device. Uh, and that was not the end of the story, but but most of what you needed to share uh, to get that conversation rolling, maybe pique somebody's interest. Uh, it's a little more complicated now because there's two parts. So there's the calculator But there's also the content side of Desmos. And so I'm going to do the history slightly out of order. But last August, three folks, uh, myself included, joined the Desmos team and uh, comprised the Desmos teaching faculty. So that's me, uh, Dan Meyer, and Christopher Danielson. And when we joined the team, the, the goal was to begin creating more content for teachers to use in their classrooms in the form of activities, not just tools, which is sort of our the previous history of Desmos, and then also to help build tools that teachers could build their own content with. So we've got something called Activity Builder that we use internally and also folks outside of the company use to to build stuff. So those are kind of the two halves at this stage in the game, uh, calculator and content, but it all basically focuses on building things for teachers and students to use in the classroom to explore and sort of delight in mathematics. And I love the word that you use, delight in mathematics, because that is not typically how people see math. Now, one thing that I'm curious about is how did you get connected with Desmos to where you actually started working for the company? How did they know to reach out to you? Yeah, so I got an email last April, uh, as I mentioned, from Dan, and he was set to join the team in August. He had finished his PhD at Stanford, uh, his title's Chief Academic Officer, and I think where that invitation came from was I was somebody online in that community sharing how I was using Desmos in my classroom, um, sharing how I was using Desmos in the professional development that I was leading with teachers. I was sharing my experiences with Desmos at conferences, 
Um, and I think that from just being visible and online, uh, there was something they saw in the work that I was doing that they thought, you know, that'd be, that'd be fun to bring on board and, and kind of round out the team and, and uh, start building things together. I remember back in October of 2014, I did a couple of sessions on Desmos at one of the state math conferences uh, here in California in Palm Springs. It's CMC South is sort of the nickname we give it. And um, I was talking about Desmos, and 30 seconds in, Eli, who's the, the founder and CEO of the company, he walks in the room, sits in the back, and I, I think I skipped a couple of heartbeats as I watched him walk in the room, but then sort of got my bearings and, and pressed on. And I think just some of that being out there, sharing what I was doing, uh, there was something appealing in that that they saw, and that led to that email and, and joining forces. So, you know, what I find fascinating is that the social media that we have now allows us to connect in ways that we haven't been able to before. And I've said for many years that ever since I joined Twitter, all the jobs I've gotten since I joined Twitter have been because of Twitter Mm -hmm. in a much less clear way than how your jobs have come to be. (laughs) And, you know, I just think that the value in connecting online with other professionals is incredibly powerful and, You know, just I love hearing stories about how that happens. And, you know, I've been following Dan Meyer for a long time and been reading his blog for a long time. And it's influenced how I'm encouraging teachers to teach and encouraged myself to teach. And anyway, just a fascinating story. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, no problem. When we use something like Desmos, it's really different than other sites. And can you talk a little bit about what the purpose of using Desmos is? And it's not like a typical math site that we think of where you basically set kids down in front of a computer and let them just go to town, do their own activities and figure everything out by themselves. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about what the role of the teacher is in using Desmos and how important that person is in being in the room and leading the discussion. Yeah, I think you've you've hinted at and sort of set up nicely for me one of the major differences, and it's what we view the role of the teacher is, both as students are using the calculator, but especially as students are using the activities that we create or that teachers themselves create. So that role of the teacher, I feel like, is a, a pretty massive distinguisher for us um, with all the other folks who are doing stuff in, I'll just say, a similar space online because I feel like it's a little bit different space. So I don't want to create a straw man argument, but it seems like a lot of the other resources that students and teachers can use online related to math instruction function equally well if students all have headphones on and they're in their computer cubicles and they're all kind of staring at the screen plugging away. And we view that as sort of a a waste of the human potential in the classroom when you've got a, a skilled teacher at the front or at the back or wandering around the room. Um, And then you've got all these little humans who, if you sort of start the right way, you you can pique their interest and have them engaged and have them dive into this social learning experience. Um, And we feel like a lot of that, if not all of that, is lost in a lot of the sort of practice-heavy, isolated, individualized is a really popular word in a lot of circles, but we feel like the over-individualization of online math education is really missing out on a lot of the potential uh, that we see in that student-to-student and teacher-to-student interaction. So we try to build things that take advantage of the fact that there's an amazing person in the room. There's that teacher there and that there's students who, you know, arguments are more fun. I think Dan mentioned in a in a blog post that showed up yesterday, arguments are more fun when there's somebody that you're arguing with. And we love math arguments in the classroom. I don't know if you're familiar with Andrew Stadel's work with Estimation 180 and, and on his blog, but he's, he's done a couple of conference sessions about getting students to argue about math. And John Stevens is another teacher that comes to mind when I think about arguing in the math classroom. So we, we like those arguments. We feel like those are good when they're done socially as opposed to just isolated with your headphones on. And that, to me, is just some of the core things that are different about us. Yeah, I'll probably start and leave it there. Okay. So, you know, when you have a teacher in the room, then it, then it changes things. And can you talk briefly about the approach that you typically use in Desmos? And if I'm not mistaken, it's it's similar to the three acts thing that 
that Dan Meyer does with one thing that he's promoted for many years. Is that how most Desmos activities are? Yeah, actually, that's not how most Desmos activities are. Certainly some of our activities, and we feel like some of our strong activities, pull from sort of that pedagogy that Dan has established with three acts. So maybe presenting students with some visual, whether it's a still frame or a video, asking them, you know, what questions come to mind, if any. And from that moment, students are typically more hooked into the lesson than a lot of typical textbook approaches. Uh, and then you build from there, ask students, you know, what information they might need to, to figure out what, what the answer to the questions that we've raised are, uh, and then building from there. Certainly a lot of that shows up in a lot of Desmos activities, but I feel like the universe of Desmos activities is a little more broad than the three-act approach. Uh, we've got an activity builder and some of the custom activities that we've built as a team. We've got things that maybe don't have a context. They don't start with a visual, but they're engaging in some other way, and they ask students to do interesting things in other ways, and they kind of maybe one of the driving forces behind all of our activities that unifies them more than, say, one pedagogical approach or another is that we want to generate interesting discussions in the classroom, and we want to equip the teacher to be a, a, a facilitator of those discussions, and we want to make sure that students are engaged in those discussions, however we make that happen. Um, in some ways, that's done with a three-act style, and in other ways, it's you know, presenting them with a, a puzzle or a challenge or a problem that they're going to need to wrestle with mathematical structure to, to solve that challenge. Cool. So really, it's it's not about having kids learn on their own, as many math sites, in my opinion, are. It's more about taking advantage of the teacher being in the room and, and generating that conversation about math rather than just doing math. Yeah. So a recent conversation we had that addresses that is the, the question of how long should uh, an activity from Desmos be? And we, we measure that in screens as students are moving from one task to another in the problem or one prompt to another or one graph to another. And I remember some of the activities I built a year ago, the activity builder, this tool that we use to build things and that folks outside of Desmos can also use, uh, was born last August. And so in August and September and October of last year, we're ramping up learning how to use these tools. And I remember I made a lot of activities that had 20, 25, 30, even more than 30 screens. And I look at the stuff that I'm building now and the things that our team is building now, and it's more on the order of six, eight, 10, 12, maybe stretches a little bit more than that. And we've talked a lot recently about the ratio of conversation per screen or opportunity for discussion per screen. And we've been trying to bump that ratio so that there's more opportunity for rich discussion in each screen. Uh, so it's definitely one of the things I mentioned. We're a work in progress. That's part of our uh, work in progress is figuring out how can we craft individual screens that are part of an entire activity that spark interesting discussion. And I feel like we've made a lot of good progress on that front and we've got a lot of, a lot of progress to still make. So what makes a good activity in Desmos? Boy, that's a, that's a great question. We asked ourselves this question literally three weeks ago, and we, we had some unwritten things in our own minds and in our own conversations, but we actually wanted to get that written down, if for no other reason just to clarify in our own minds as we were building an activity, yeah, this one looks promising, and this one, I think we should sort of start over with, with a new idea or a revamp of, of this one. So we ended up writing down, and this list will probably grow and be revised, but we've got 13 statements about what we think makes a good activity. We call it our activity building code, and we actually shared this with the, the wider world a few days ago on the Desmos blog, and I'll just run through some of these. I don't know if you want me to give a, a sample, because 13 is a pretty long list. Do you want to give me a sense of how many of these should I touch on briefly? Take a couple of them and okay. touch on those briefly, and I've got a link to that post oh, in, in the show notes. So transformativeprinciple.org search for Michael Fenton's name on who do you want to learn learn from and then you'll be able to see all the show notes about what he's talking about so we'll talk about just a couple but you can get the full list from the show notes great well I'll just take the first three and, and so people can can go in order and uh, press on to the end of that list so the first one that we wrote down is incorporate a variety of verbs 
and nouns. And this actually goes back to your question about how is Desmos different, if at all, from a lot of the other tools and resources that are available online in math education. And what you'll find on a lot of sites, and a lot of the sites tend to be practice-based sites, and they tend to be machine-graded and instant feedback and that sort of nature. If you're going to push for instant feedback and machine grading and you know scores that you can easily export into your gradebook, etc., you have to limit the style of things that you ask students to do. And we want to not limit that. In fact, we want to expand that and stretch ourselves as much as we can so that when we say, you know, students, I want you to do X, that there are a lot of different verbs that go in that place. So we want students to sketch something, to drag a movable point to make a prediction. We want them to estimate. We want them to calculate. We want them to settle a dispute. We want them to offer a counter argument. We want them to make a conjecture. We want them to do all these different things. And by varying those verbs, we feel like not only it makes a more interesting and engaging activity, it doesn't feel like 50 of the same thing. And there's that tedium by the time you get to the 10th or 12th one, and you're, you're not even halfway done yet. And instead, we're going to uh, provide that variety and hopefully not only draw students into the activity, but also give them a more challenging and rich experience. And we've talked a few points on the podcast already about providing opportunities for discussion. And I feel like the discussion becomes more rich if the verbs are are more varied. Um, Michael, can I jump in here a minute? Yeah, absolutely. You're talking about the discussion. And I know they... When they submit their answers, they submit them to the class. So they see that. But are you actually talking to them? I mean, and was the purpose of the pause activity so that you could stop everybody and have that audible discussion? Yeah, that great questions. And let me provide a little bit of context for folks who are listening who don't know the tools as well as, as you and I do. So there's a feature, we call it WAS, or What Other Students Said, where the default setting for a, a text input as we're building these activities is that students will see the responses of three random peers from the class um, after they've submitted their own answer. So they get a sense of what other students are saying. Uh, that's something you can disable on a question-by-question -question basis, and for very good reasons at times we do disable that. And that does get at some of the discussion, some of the, like, there are mm -hmm. other humans in the room, and I'm going to learn from them as well, not just me and the machine. But, and then, okay, so the second thing you mentioned is pause. We recently released the second and third of three classroom conversation tools. The first, a while back, was a tool called Anonymize, where it will replace all the students' names in the, the teacher dashboard, which is where we can display student work to the rest of the class using a projector. You can anonymize all of those names. It replaces them with names of famous mathematicians, which is part of that delightfulness that we try to aim for. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of that is when you're having these discussions to allow students to focus on the math and the responses, not who was right, who was wrong, you know, whose answer are we talking about now? So anonymize is one. Pause, you mentioned, that's the, the second of these classroom conversation tools. And that really is designed at getting the conversation out of the machine and into the air, into the room, so that we're using our voices, not just our keyboards to communicate to one another. We, we feel like a silent classroom using a Desmos activity, if it's silent all the way, <laughs> that's a missed opportunity for the students and for the teacher. So we're trying to build a suite of tools around our activities um, that, that encourages students and teachers into those healthy spaces of discussing. So the what other students said, the WAS, where you get to see what your classmates said after you've submitted your response, we feel like that's helpful, but certainly not, not all there is uh, to be had in terms of discussion. A lot of that as we envision it. Uh, in fact, as it played out yesterday, I was in a classroom uh, at the school that I used to teach at. I taught a couple of periods, testing out some of our new features, and I used that pause activity to draw their attention to the front of the room, uh, to pose some questions, to highlight individual responses, to ask for more responses out loud. Uh, and that was, to be honest, and I guess it doesn't matter, we don't, we care in some senses more about the student experience than the teacher experience, but the teacher experience in some senses is a good proxy for the student experience. And that was my favorite part of being in the classroom yesterday was when I would hit pause and then we would talk about all the ideas that the screens had been stirring up in students' minds, but we needed to push those ideas further, maybe take their informal thinking and push it uh, a little closer towards maybe the formal mathematical thinking that we're trying to build toward. And yes, pause is, 
is a tool that supports those conversations. And there's one other tool that folks can read about on the blog that, that we feel like does a great job or at least is a nice next step in supporting uh, and facilitating those conversations. So, yeah, as it ties into verbs and nouns and, and discussions, those tools are, are definitely key pieces of that puzzle. That was a great interview with uh, Michael, and I'm pretty excited to continue it next week when we talk about bundles versus one-off activities and the progression of units. And we'll talk a little bit about assessments and how one school district has uh, started using Desmos for testing, which is uh, pretty exciting since it's such a powerful modern tool that is very cool. So that'll be next week. Please, uh, if you don't mind taking a minute to rate this podcast in iTunes, I'd greatly appreciate it. And if you want to learn from any of the other 140 interviews that I've got on here, uh, go to transformativeprinciple.org and search for someone that you want to learn from. And if you're searching for somebody and I haven't interviewed them, please let me know and I would love to interview them. Thank you so much for listening. Transformative Principal is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators by educators. Visit edupodcastnetwork.com for more great podcasts.